to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Central Europe. I hope everybody is having a fantastic week so far, staying healthy and staying strong. In this class, we are looking at reading for the IELTS exam. Specifically, we're going to focus on good strategy, which leads to great scores. Now, this is a members chat class. Of course, everybody is welcome to watch. There's lots to learn. The third section of the uh, reading uh, in the general version of the exam is very similar to the academic reading passages. This is going to be an academic uh, reading passage, which of course is a bit more challenging. Uh, again, it's great for learning. Hi, Hassan. Hi, Carolina. Abhishek, Sammy, Preeti. Nice to see our members jumping in on the class. This class is presented to everyone by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Please visit us there and join our premium package for general IELTS. Check us out at gieltshelp.com. That's generaliltshelp.com. On both of our websites, we have lots and lots of materials to help you prepare, learn the right strategies, improve your communication, improve your English. This is aehelp.com. You can click that big red button to join the premium package. And this is the general version of our website with the green background at gieltshelp.com. Click that big red button. We help hundreds, if not thousands, of students every single day to pass their IELTS exam. So be one of our many successful students. And of course, if you have any questions, just send me an email to adrian at aehelp.com. Hi, Rashika. Hi, Nikhil. Hi, Jainil Ois Preeti. Nice to see more of the members coming in on time. That's fantastic. Uh, we'll get right into our reading passage for the day. And of course, for everybody who's not able to join the chat right now, uh, we will have an all chat class coming up in about 90 minutes that will focus on task one writing uh, for the academic IELTS and everybody will be able to join the chat there. Again, it's valuable to watch the class regardless. All right, so uh, let's get into today's reading passage. This is coming from our first exam and it's the first reading passage. The title of the passage is Mountains of Ice. Uh, we have 10 full exams now. Um, and uh, for both the academic and general. And in total, we have about 40 or 45 reading passages between the general and the academic, or maybe even more, maybe 60. Uh, but anyway, this is the very, very first one. And this reading passage, Mountains of Ice, you can see from the picture uh, that we're dealing with this phenomenon, which of course comes from the north and south poles of the earth. Uh, what is this called? Remember, does anybody know what this is called? This big chunk of ice that's uh, floating in the water? That's right, Carolina. It's an iceberg. Right, Abhishek? Very good, Nick Hill. Iceberg. That's right. We'll be uh, dealing with uh, this phenomenon. Now, when you're reading a passage like this, especially a passage that's very, very physical in nature, uh, what is a really important strategy to implement right away? Yeah, Janiel, some icebergs come from uh, Antarctica, some from Greenland, northern Canada, so various places, absolutely. Start thinking about that. And what other strategy uh, must you immediately start implementing when you have especially uh, such a physical real world, very present, concrete type of topic. So what's the strategy that should... Yeah, very good, Sammy. Visualize, absolutely. So visualization is one of the key strategies that we often reference and talk about. It's one of the most powerful learning uh, strategies and communication strategies for humans. Because we're visual creatures, we see the world around us. We learn a lot by seeing, uh, and uh, uh, we need to uh, really implement this strategy. So Carolina says, see myself there. And Carolina, you're jumping ahead of me, which is great. So uh, you must uh, visualize information 
that you read in passages. Uh, seeing, let me do it this way, seeing information as you listen, read, write, and speak makes comprehension and communication much clearer, okay? Humans are visual beings. Now, there are a lot of specific strategies and practice for what's called effective visualization. And for those of you who have our premium course, you should be thinking about the premium package key strategies here that we introduce. Uh, when you visualize effectively the information in the reading, what's the first point that you have to um, think about? So what's the very, very first point that you have to think about? Even before seeing yourself there, Carolina, um, what precedes this? And this is kind of linear. You should think about this first of all. So when you think, okay, visualize, then you should always think, number one, I have to do this. Sammy, yeah, you want to think uh, about yourself in the picture, but even before that, what do you want to see? So what is it that you have to focus on whenever you visualize? And especially in our fast world these days, uh, we tend to ignore this or not do this well enough. And there are actually a lot of um, images out there which speak to this online. So when you... Uh, when you hear the word elephant or when you read the word elephant, uh, what should you immediately consider as you uh, read the word elephant? You should consider detail. Okay, so always work hard and give effort to visualize images in great detail. Okay. And perhaps uh, you'll agree with me on this, that in our modern world, we often don't give attention to detail in images, not as much as past generations. So we tend to see a lot of graphics and pictures that lack detail, which is quite ironic because we have these OLED and 8K uh, TVs and so on that have a lot of detail, yet in our visualization or in our images, we kind of ignore detail. Uh, in advertising, you see a lot of pictures that lack detail. I think, Carolina, you work with uh, graphics and advertising, and maybe you see this often that there's just a lot of graphics that lack detail. Think emojis, for example, right? It's just a happy face. There's no detail, okay? So, you want to see detail. So when you read the word elephant, uh, many people might see kind of this uh, animal, uh, okay? And uh, I'm just gonna try to draw an elephant here. Um, okay, so there, there's an elephant. I'll give it a little eyeball there. Um, so many people will see this kind of elephant image uh, when, um, when, they see, when they hear the word elephant. And it's very common for us to lack details. So when you hear the word elephant, uh, an example of practicing visualizing detail and adding detail to information that you read is first of all decide, is this an African elephant or is it an Indian elephant? If it's an African elephant, then we need to give it that much bigger kind of flappy ear. Okay, if it's an Indian elephant, it's going to have a smaller ear. Okay, um, if it's a nice big male elephant, then it's going to have these tusks coming out of its mouth. Um, it has the nostrils, and it, elephants often have these deep wrinkles on their trunks uh, because they move them around. They're very muscular. Elephants, in fact, have beautiful long eyelashes. If you ever take a close look at an elephant, um, oftentimes elephants will have a little bird uh, sitting 
on their back eating insects. Um, they have tufts on the end of their tail, which are usually quite a bit shorter. So they'll have a little tuft on their tail. And they have these beautiful uh, kind of nails, I guess you could call, on their feet. Okay, And lots of veins in their ears, which help them to uh, keep cool. And they have these big protruding uh, foreheads as well. So uh, when you're thinking about an elephant, give it enough attention to come up with the detail that will help you to better think about information and process information. And this is very important for active reading, okay? Carolina says, there's an elephant, right? And notice how that emoji, at least it's got a trunk, right? Um, so uh, maybe the emojis of the future will be more detailed as well. Okay, so the first point when you're visualizing is to have a lot of detail. And the reason why you include detail um, in uh, your visualization is so that you can understand information clear, okay? So to understand information clear, okay? When you give detail, you understand clear. Now, uh, many of our members said the second really important part of effective visualization is include yourself, okay? So always be a, an active uh, part of the information that you are reading and visualizing, okay? This means not like watching a TV screen or a computer screen where you're inactive and you're far away. So you're not just, so not just uh, a distant observer or audience, right? Okay, so you want to be part of that image. So in this reading passage, uh, mountains of ice, when we're reading about these icebergs, these big chunks of ice that are uh, floating in the ocean, uh, perhaps you're on top of one of these uh, icebergs and you're climbing up with your ice axe or ice pick and you're moving up the mountain. You got maybe a little climber's hat on or something like that, a little backpack, and you're happy about this. What an exciting adventure. You're floating and you're, you got maybe a little flag in your hand uh, that you're planning to put on the top of the iceberg. Okay, so that's what you're doing. Okay, and I'm really happy to see that some of our members are using our courses. I'm guessing Jai Neal, uh, you got this from the course as well which is great, yeah. So the reason that we include ourselves, so this would be Adrian, this is me, okay. Uh, it's not just some guy, uh, but it's Adrian. Um, so we should be there, we should be active in that information. This is what people always did in the past and we still do it when we're reading books, okay. And the reason we do that is because it helps us to remember information. So. This helps the mind remember information better and longer, okay? And if we go into psychology, it's called long-term potentiation, but I'm not going to get really technical on you. Um, when the brain feels like it's active uh, then uh, and it's a part of the event, it tends to remember the information much more. So when the brain feels it is an active participant in the information, it will give more uh, neural activity to retain that information. Okay, so again, for active reading, for good reading skills, where you get to the questions uh, and you still remember what you read, this is what you want to do. You want to be a part of that information, not just some distant story uh, or image on a television. Okay. All right. Um, so far, so good. Let's see who remembers what the third important step is in effective visualization strategy. Hi, Natalie. So what is the third effective part of visualization and visualization strategy? There's one more step here. And... 
That's important, just like the first two. What should we really pay attention to? Okay. What is that third important point? One more here. So make, make it detailed, include yourself. And the third one is, what is it? It's very important. Is three, two, one, nobody? Okay. It's to make it unique. Okay, make it unique. Yeah, Jainil, it's not to recall the information. That's the reason for it, right? But what we're actually doing is we're making the information unique. So make it different, okay? Make it emotional. Make it strange. Make it happy. So uh, make it emotional, strange, powerful, okay? Okay. Uh, the brain does not handle information well, which is very common and every day. Okay, so if you um, learn English by reading sentences like uh, John ate uh, an apple, okay. Uh, this is boring, and the brain does not learn well with this type of information. But if you read something like John choked on a red apple, until the love of his life came along and saved him. This is emotional, okay? And powerful. Nobody wants to choke on an apple. The brain will learn from this. This is why I always tell students when you're choosing a book to read to get ready for the IELTS exam, always read a book that you find interesting and exciting, okay? You're just going to uh, learn much better from it. And the reason for this is to make or uh, to recall information more, okay? So here... Um, when I said visualize in detail, so in detail, here I am again climbing this uh, mountain with my pickaxe, okay? I have my flag. Uh, my flag maybe has my country of happy emojis that I'm going to put on top, so I'm making it unique. Um, there is myself. I have my hat with my adventurer feather in there. Okay, um, and I have my uh, lucky ladybug uh, backpack that I take with me everywhere. Okay, that's making it unique and strange. Uh, this way, I'm going to recall all of the information that I am now connecting with icebergs and the information that's uh, given about icebergs, okay? So I'm basically tricking or manipulating my brain into managing the information and the content of the reading passage. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, that's going to take me way too much effort, way too much time in the IELTS exam. That's only true if you don't practice, okay? If you practice these kinds of strategies, and let's call them tricks uh, for simplicity's sake, uh, in your active reading, you will become very fast at applying these kinds of techniques and you will become very efficient at it. Now, I know some of our members have heard me say this information uh, before. Um, who has been, and be honest, who has been practicing this kind of active 
reading an active visualizing strategy when you're going through your reading passages. So when you're reading about volcanoes, skyscrapers, dinosaurs. Okay, so Carolina says, I have, I've been practicing this kind of visualization. Um, great, Nikhil says, I am too, and uh, Hassan says, me. And what's your experience? Is it effective for you? Are you becoming faster at it? Are you becoming efficient? Do you find that it's a waste of time? Uh, have you discovered any new ideas that work really well for you to be more efficient at this? So um, share with me, okay? Share with students. You don't have to write it in right now, but if something comes to mind at any point, just share with us, okay? Uh, visualizing is a very broad um, field of uh, skills and expertise that there's a lot of information on it. So if you type in visualization strategies on the internet, on Google, you'll get lots of information. There are books on this. Okay. Here we go. So Hassan says it's very effective. I even took an online course about that. Yeah, exactly. Hassan, there are specific courses where the entire course is dedicated to improving visualization skills. And it's a great idea to take part in a course like that or in a workshop like that, Hassan. I agree a hundred percent. Okay. I've done a couple myself, of course, as well. And they're very, very effective. Okay. So it's a great help in life. It's like learning to touch type, right? So Hassan says, most of what I said is in that course. Excellent. Good feedback, Hassan. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, Natalie, don't give up. So Natalie's saying, I'm trying it, but it, I'm lacking imagination, unfortunately. Um, yeah, Natalie, it's because we're out of practice. Humanity is out of practice in visualization because we have so much visual information on our phones and TV. So we're really out of practice when it comes to using our imagination and visualization. We don't read enough and we see too much visual information. But don't give up, Natalie, because we have this skill. It's in our brain. We just have to um, practice it. We have to work on it, okay? So let's do this. Okay, students, so we're going to read Mountains of Ice. We're going to do this together, and then we're going to answer the questions. So Mountains of Ice, something about icebergs, North Pole, South Pole, it's frozen ocean water, um, okay, it's dangerous for boats. So I'm thinking about all of this information. I look at the questions. Uh, I notice that I can read uh, questions one through five because it's matching information to the paragraph. So which paragraph contains the following information? I'm visualizing, paraphrasing all the way here, okay? So the reason why only a small part of an iceberg floats above water. So I visualize that small part of the iceberg, the big part underneath. Uh, marine tracking improvements, problems with the watertight compartments, location of icebergs, the causes of the Titanic sinking. Okay. Let me just jump to the right because we're going to end up with a lot of questions here. So just give me one second here. I'm going to jump ahead here in the content because I'm at the curriculum test and it's not quite where I want to be. Okay, so give me a moment here. All right, that's where I want to be. I want to be in the review test. Otherwise, we're going to be here for a very long time. Okay, so let's go to the questions again. Uh, here we go. We got some yes, no, not given uh, questions. As many of you know, we don't uh, worry about these until after the passage. And then here we have some uh, summary completion questions. So let's read this. Let's visualize this. The sinking of the Titanic. Uh, because there was no international group, which monitored icebergs in 1912. It was the sole responsibility of the to make sure there were no icebergs in the ship's path. The chief reason the iceberg wasn't detected was the 
of the sea that night. Because of this, there were no waves crashing against the iceberg, making it difficult to spot. The captain swerved, but the iceberg scraped the side of the ship, ripping the something of the ship. Things should have been fine, nevertheless, but the watertight compartments were poorly designed. And once the water was in a few compartments, it was able to into all the others. This was a major engineering defect, which resulted in the eventual sinking. Okay. Uh, now, uh, everyone, this is reading, so don't just listen to me. It's not a listening exercise here. Uh, make sure that you're also reading. Okay. So read. And of course, the other strategy that's really important is to practice reading aloud, aloud, so we can, uh, we can hear ourselves uh, reading and pronouncing words. Okay. All right. It's a little bit brighter here for us. Okay. Uh, so let's keep going here. So this type of question, we definitely want to quickly review it. All right. And then here we have some uh, complete the sentence questions. These are also good to read before the passage. Keep visualizing. To avoid a Titanic-like disaster in the future, something formed the International Ice Patrol, IIP. Uh, the IIP's goal is to track the relevant data and something of icebergs. The Canadian Space Agency bounces something off the water to measure iceberg movement. This data renders large-scale maritime disasters something. Okay, here we go, everyone. Let's do some reading practice, visualization, active reading, active visualization. All right, from the top, from the title. Mountains of ice. The word iceberg derives from the Dutch word isberg, meaning ice mountain. Icebergs are sections of glaciers that have broken off during the warmer summer months and float freely in open water. Icebergs are typically found in open water, predominantly around Greenland and Antarctica. The characteristics of icebergs, their historical impact, and the methods we employ today to monitor them are important topics. I see myself sitting on, a, on an iceberg out in the middle of nowhere, and I'm actually fishing. Okay, this is my fishing rod here. And I've got my hook. And I'm trying to get some food because I'm out in the middle of nowhere. And I feel, of course, some giant uh, satellite in space uh, watching me on this iceberg out in the middle of nowhere. So that's the quick image that I've created. And students who have been with me for a while probably realize that I'm always creating different images. Okay. So there are lots of different ways to visualize. It's unique. I'm fishing. I'm in open water. There's this big iceberg floating around and I'm being watched from space. Okay. Yeah, Hassan, in the not given, the given information, but not relevant to the question. Um, yeah, if it's not given, that definitely means that there's no relevant information. I think that's what you're asking. But yeah, sometimes that's tricky. Okay, a little bit off topic right now. But yeah, I get what you're asking. And yes, it's not relevant. Okay. All right, here we go, everyone. So the reason icebergs exist is because of the difference between the density of ice and the density of salt water. The density of ice is approximately 920 kilograms per cubic meter, while the density of salt water is approximately 1,025 kilograms per cubic meter. Because ice is less dense than water, it floats. However, because the difference in densities is so small, only about 
of the iceberg is visible above the ocean's surface. The rest of the iceberg hides below the water. This is the origin of the familiar expression, tip of the iceberg, used to describe a situation where only part of the problem is noticeable. Okay. All right. So here I can continue with my fishing visualization, or I might actually see myself holding a balance. Let me just get some really long arms going here so you can see this clearly. Okay. Um, so I'm holding a balance and on this side of the balance, I have an iceberg. Okay. And on this side of the balance, I have the same sized uh, salt water. Okay. And here I only have a difference of 10%. Okay, so I can quickly build this visualization where this is not horizontal. I got a bit of a tip here. So this is my salt water. This is my iceberg. And my iceberg is a bit lighter than my water of the same size. So I visualize that. Okay, and again, it's me that's holding this, uh, this balance beam here. Okay, everybody with me? So... Uh, is anybody visualizing something similar or are you visualizing something different? What are you seeing? So what do you see? Okay, let me know. Write it into the chat, members. Write into the chat what you've seen so far. I'm going to keep reading, but take a minute to type into the chat what you see when you hear this information or when you read this information because you should be reading. Okay. All right, I'm going to keep going here. So icebergs range in height from one meter all the way up to seven to over 75 meters above sea level. The height measures the visible portion of the iceberg. The tallest icebergs may have a total height of over 650 meters, including their underwater portion. The largest ever recorded was 168 meters above the water, meaning the entire height of this floater was likely greater than 1,500 meters. For reference, that is twice the height of most skyscrapers. Different sized icebergs have different name classifications. The smallest icebergs are called brash ice, the next category up in size is called growlers, and the ones after that are called bergy bits. For whatever reason, after those three classes, the people in charge of naming the icebergs got a little less creative. The next classes simply range from small to very large. Icebergs can be massive objects. Very large icebergs can weigh more than 200,000 tons. The largest iceberg ever recorded was over 30,000 square kilometers in area. Again, for reference, that is approximately the size of the country of Belgium. Just imagine that. That's quite an, a visual image. Okay. So Sammy says, I'm visualizing ice cubes floating in the water. Okay, Sammy, that's fine. Make sure you're in uh, that image. So you should be holding that cup of salt water with the ice cubes uh, floating in there. Okay. All right. Ferdov says if the density of ice and salt water was the same, we wouldn't see the icebergs. Yeah, they would probably be just somewhere in the water, right? Abhishek says I'm doing fishing and some icebergs floating in front of me are just 10% of the total. Okay, yeah, so I'll be checking you're continuing with the fishing analogy. Uh, Nick Hill says, I'm seeing myself floating on the iceberg and seeing 10% ab above the water. Okay, Hassan says, glass of clear water, ice is on top while salt water is on the bottom. Good. Natalie says, I'm just trying to remember the formula for density. Don't get lost in details, Natalie. That's too much detail. And notice how I... Um, figured that out. Okay. Also, Natalie, when you visualize and you keep a record, so you keep um, like a log of one, two, three, four of what you see, uh, it's easy to go back and find that information. All right. Okay. 
So here you should be visualizing that country sized iceberg. The most famous iceberg in history is undoubtedly the one which eventually sunk the English ship Titanic off the coast of Newfoundland in 1912. At that point in time, there was no central group which monitored iceberg activity. Ships relied on lookouts to spot the iceberg. For the Titanic, the unfortunate attitude was that any iceberg big enough to do damage to the ship would be seen in time. This attitude was, of course, catastrophically wrong. The main reason it failed was the remarkable calmness of the water that ill-fated night. The easiest way to spot an iceberg from afar is to see waves crashing up against it. But on the night the Titanic sank, there were no such helpful waves. For all intents and purposes, the iceberg was invisible until it was too late. The captain swerved at the last minute, but as the side of the ship scraped across the iceberg, the hull of the ocean liner tore open. Things still may have been fine had it not been for the poorly designed watertight compartments. It turns out that when too many compartments were affected, the water was simply able to spill over to all the other compartments. This was an engineering defect that contributed to the Titanic's sinking. After the disaster of the Titanic, maritime authorities realized that a system needed to be put into place to monitor icebergs so that such a catastrophe would not be repeated. By 1914, the International Ice Patrol, IIP, was formed. Their purpose was to track all of the relevant meteorological and oceanographical data and to chart the movement of all major icebergs. Today, technology is used to track iceberg data. The Canadian Space Agency has multiple radar satellites which send microwaves off the ocean surface and record the reflection to track the movement of the iceberg. Maritime vessels have access to this information in real time which allows them to know exactly where any local icebergs are at any moment, meaning that a repeat of the Titanic disaster is virtually impossible. Let's go to the questions. We should have lots of visual information now about icebergs, their size, their name classification, why they exist, what kind of harm or damage they can cause to humans, and how humans have used technology to track icebergs and avoid future disasters. Okay. So Jainil says, I'm uh, on the top of an iceberg, which is above the sea level, and l it's large, like my state of Gujarat. Very good, Jainil. That's good visualization. Okay. Abhishek says, the Titanic paragraph reminds me about the film. Yeah, I mean, it's very accurate, Abhishek. So there you would be on the Titanic, right? You don't see the iceberg. It's too late. You're on this Titanic. It's a scary situation. It's sinking with you on it. Okay. All right, so here we go. Number one, icebergs are sections of glaciers that have broken off in the winter months. Is it important to know what uh, icebergs are, how they're formed. Yes, it's important. Is it true that icebergs are sections of glaciers that have broken off in the winter months? So Abhishek says it's important. Ferdovs agrees. Hassan agrees. Very good. And is it true? No, it's not true. Why is it not true? So here it's yes, no, not given. So in our answer sheet, we put N. And why is it not true? Yeah, because it's the warmer summer months, which makes logical sense. Now, um, here, the important word is winter instead of the word summer. Very good, students. I'm really happy that you caught that. So this is a detail. Okay. And this is another reminder of why you must practice detailed visualization because by practicing detailed visualization, you catch details in the text and in the questions. Does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up on that. It's an important point. Okay. 
a lot of times students lose uh, scores on IELTS not because of the English but because of the details all right and when you practice visualizing with details then you visualize the warm months so hopefully when we were reading that some of you saw that ooh scorcher it's 40 degrees plus okay so you visualize that warm month with the hot sun shining down on you and then breaking off those chunks of um, uh, ice. And here, when you read this, you visualize the maybe the snowflake, okay? Um, and you realize that, ooh, this is like minus 20. Uh, so this and this are the opposites. So this has to be a no, right? Okay. So IELTS is testing you in many ways and not just in English, okay? Especially the academic, all right? But even the general, okay? Uh, has anybody looked at the uh, task to uh, writing um, marking criteria? You'll notice there that one of the marking criteria is task completion. And if you read the band six, seven, eight, nine in the task to uh, task completion, you realize that it basically has nothing to do with English. It just has to do all about how you think about the question and answer the question. Okay. And IELTS is doing this throughout the exam. They're testing not just your English, but they're testing your critical thinking, your visualization, your uh, communication skills, which is much more than just a language. Okay. Um, Hassan, it won't. When you practice, it becomes a part of your thinking and it becomes automatic, just like driving a car. Okay. All right. Um, let's go to the next one. Icebergs exist because of the different densities of ice and salt water. Is it important to know why icebergs exist? Yeah, it's important. And Ferdov says, yeah, it's true. Okay. I agree. So yes, it's important. And yes, it's true. They wouldn't exist if there wasn't that difference uh, because then they would simply just disappear. We wouldn't see them, right? So yes. Okay. All right. 90% of the iceberg is hidden below the water. Is it important to know how much of the iceberg we can see, how much of it is hidden? Yeah, I think that's important. And is it true? Abhishek says yes, because only 10% is above the water, and that means 90% is below the water, and that's 100%. So yes, it's true. Yeah, very good. So again, a little bit of logic, right? Paraphrasing and logic, okay? Now make sure, students, that when you have yes, no, not given, you're putting Ys, not Ts, and not Fs, because then you'll get those wrong, okay? All right, the name classifications of icebergs derive from the Dutch language. Name classifications derive from Dutch language. Is it important to know where the name classification of icebergs comes from for this passage? Or is it maybe too much detail? Yeah, it's not important because it's too much detail. It's T-M-D, okay? Too much detail. When you see that, it's going to be a not given, especially for a first passage, okay? Too much detail. Yeah, you're not going to have that level of detail. It's a little bit confusing because they tell you that the word iceberg comes from the Dutch language but they don't tell you where the name classifications come from. They just give those to you, right? So careful not to fall for these kinds of trickier questions, okay? All right, uh, some icebergs can be the size of a country or, Jainil, or I think it, maybe it was Abhishek, the uh, state of India. <laughs> okay, so some icebergs can be the size of a country or the size of a state in India. Is it important how big icebergs can be? Yeah, I think that's very important for this passage, the size of icebergs. That's one of the reasons they're really 
unique. If they were just the size of an ice cube in a martini glass, that would not be so exciting. So it's definitely uh, interesting for us. And yes, they can be absolutely Rashika. So Janiel says like Belgian. Yeah. So yeah, they they can be massive. Absolutely. Okay, very good. So that's how we do that. We first figure out if it's important. If it's important, it's given. If it's not important, it's not given. We move on. If it's too much detail, it's likely not given. We move on. If it's given, then we have to figure out if it's true or not. And that's the fastest way to solve true, false, not given, or yes, no, not given questions. Okay. All right, here we go. Let's do this. Because there was no international group which monitored icebergs in 1912, it was the sole responsibility of the something to make sure there were no icebergs in the ship's path. So uh, whose responsibility was it to make sure there are no icebergs in front of the ship? And these people used to sit in the crow's nest of the boat. It's called the crow's nest, which is a very high uh, point on the boat. If it's a sailboat, it's on the mast. Uh, Nick Hill and Abhishek says the lookouts, yeah, because they're looking and they're looking out and there are many of them. So it's the lookouts, one word of the lookouts to make sure that there were no icebergs. Yeah, so it's the people looking out. Hey, everything's good. No icebergs. Okay, very nice. All right. The chief reason the iceberg wasn't detected was the something of the sea that night. So what was, ironically, what was the situation in the sea? Which is ironic because when people think about boats sinking, they think about a big storm, big waves crashing. And in this case, there weren't big waves and it wasn't a big storm. It was the calmness. It was very calm. Calmness of the sea. So it's the noun form of calm, Jainiel. That's right. Very good, Nick Hill. I like the capital letters. So calmness of the sea that night. Excellent. Because of this, there were no waves. So calmness, no waves. Second help for that answer. Crashing against the iceberg, making it difficult to spot. The captain swerved. Swerved means to go urge. So if you're driving a car and suddenly Another car cuts in front of you and you grab the steering wheel and you swerve. It means you swerve the car. So they swerve the ship. They're trying to get the ship out of the path. Okay, so remember this verb, swerve, swerved. The captain swerved, but the iceberg scraped the side of the ship, ripping the something of the ship. So what part of the ship was damaged? This is the big kind of the stomach of the ship, but it's not called the stomach. Um, what is it called? It's the big kind of bottom part of the ship. Ripping the something. That's right for doves. It's the hull of the ship. Think about the word hull and then replace the A with a U. Okay. So think of the word hall, like hallway. Okay, hall, hallway, and then replace the A with the U and you end up with a hull. A hull is kind of like the hallway of the ship, right? Hall, hallway of the ship, okay? Uh, things should have been fine nevertheless, but the watertight compartments were poorly designed. And once the water was in a few compartments, it was able to... And this is going to be a verb, of course. It's going to be a verb that means move. But for water, we don't say move. We say spill. That's right. And not spill out, uh, Hassan. Hassan, don't write a... So, Hassan, pay attention to this. You have a preposition there. Uh, usually when you have a preposition, you don't need another preposition. Sometimes, yes, Hassan, but um, this, that would make it a phrasal verb. We don't need a phrasal verb here. We just need the verb, spill, spill into. Okay, All right? So uh, really always pay attention to the before and the after words uh, for spaces. 
okay? And this was a major engineering defect which resulted in the eventual sinking. Okay, uh, students, here we have a few more questions. Um, 10, 11, and 12, I'll let you deal with these on your own. I know many of our members are already familiar with this. Members that don't uh, know the answers, send the answers to my email and I will let you know uh, what the correct answers are for our viewers as well for these last four, okay? And then uh, we'll uh, do another class here in 40 minutes, which will be a new uh, task one writing question that we'll go through uh, for the academic IELTS. That's going to be an original question as well that we haven't covered in the past. Importantly, everyone, uh, practice effective visualization. Remember details. Remember to include yourself. Remember to make it unique. This is one of the many strategies that you will find at aehelp.com for academic IELTS and gialtshelp.com for general. So definitely uh, check those out. Uh, for all of you who are practicing these, good for you. Okay, you're very welcome, Carolina. You're welcome, Hassan. Rashika, nice participation in today's class. I know it was a review for some of you, but again, that's another important strategy is to not just do the work and materials once, but review them, commit them to memory, uh, take different angles, practice in different ways. So too often students just keep going through newer and newer materials. That's not always good. Often it's good to go back and review older materials, reread them, get more information, understand more from them. Uh, for everybody watching, uh, check us out at aehelp.com for academic outs, gialtshelp.com for general outs. Hopefully I will see you all in about 40 minutes for some writing. I'm Adrian signing out from beautiful Budapest. Much love to you and see you shortly. Bye for now.